Yes, I have known Elizabeth, or heir as she later called herself, since her birth in 1894. As she grew, she reminded me of the illustrations of Charles Gibson, a true Gibson girl, minus the bouffant, always slim and radiating physical grace. Elizabeth's father was not the best, always too busy with his job as a patent attorney for the steel mill. Her mother was slowly affected by a neurological ailment and was finally institutionalized. After that tragic day, Elizabeth, her sisters, and her father moved into my house, where I have my architectural practice. My sister and I offered both our assistance and guidance, both as a sculptor and an architect. As an example, look at her drawing of me in the parlor. I'm proud of this and had it framed and hung in my office. She wrote to us that she was happy in school and learning new techniques. So I'm happy to report that she graduated with honors. So after three years of study, she left the school in 1915 to join the studio of painter and sculptor Catherine Wentworth. Wentworth encouraged Elizabeth to exhibit her latest paintings at an exposition that is located in the Grand Central Palace. In conclusion, I believe that she pursued and achieved beauty, at least on campus. For those who do not know me, I am Pierre Delenix, who after a whirlwind romance, wed Miss Elizabeth, took her to Paris, and expose her to booze, free love, and the art of the lost generation. In 1917, I met Elizabeth talking with veterans as part of her job with the Committee for Public Information. Since both of us typically work ourselves to death, going to a dance was a real change, and we discovered we were both desperate for love. We wed later that year. In 1918, as part of my job with the French Foreign Ministry, I was ordered home immediately to begin post-war negotiations with the Allies and Germany. We arrived in Paris in August, and I found a second-floor apartment and 20 rural Jacob. I took Elizabeth around to my favorite haunts with ample opportunity to drink and dance. We met artists from Picasso in painting, Hemingway in writing, and Elaine Gray in furniture. In every bar and restaurant we stopped at. In 1920, she
she met and took lessons from Constantine Barcuzzi, the famous sculptor, and created some three-dimensional stone sculptures. She also discovered that the first floor occupant of her apartment building was the famous novelist Natalie Barney. Natalie invited her to her weekly salon where fashionable artists shared their art and an occasional dance over wine and cheese. One week, a visiting gypsy fortune teller told Elizabeth that she would soon have a child and discover she was bisexual. And it came to pass that Elizabeth had a 20-year on-and-off relationship with Natalie while maintaining an active, loving relationship with yours truly, her loving husband. To me, the only relevant news was that our new daughter, Anne, was a joy in our lives. In 1927, Evelyn Wilde invited Elizabeth to join the Women's Weaving Workshop in downtown Paris. Both loved British wool and studied various dyeing and weaving techniques. They felt that the rugs offered a wonderful opportunity to introduce color into a room. They also discovered the beauty of Japanese lacquerware that was made of a sap of a tree that was native to Japan. The artist learned to stain and paint geometric columns and then seal the color by coating lacquer on the work. She also found that adding texture, color, and lacquer to a piece added to its uniqueness. In conclusion, Paris offered Elizabeth ample opportunities to blossom in love and in art. Hello. To continue this narration, I am Adult Chenu. I am the cabinet maker for the furniture that Elizabeth designed in Paris in the 1920s. One of the first pieces of furniture that I discussed with her was a long shallow table called a console table to be placed in the entryway. She wanted to create a paradoxical pairing of materials, such as this sideboard that used a cork wood veneer to cover the boards and used lacquer covering the trim. The cabinet maker could create a two-door sideboard with oak inside fitted with shelves and two drawers and she would add the specialized veneer and build up the layers of finish. In 1928, she was invited to submit a piece of furniture to the annual exhibition of furniture designers. She came up with a design that featured a two-level table in wood that was covered with black linoleum. The final piece had a lower level that formed a strut and was stained white. It was well received and replicated for future sales. In 
The next annual competition was the Salon du Sun. In the furniture category, Elizabeth faced early competition from, from Charlotte Perriot, who made a metal chaise lounge that was covered in animal fur. Elizabeth decided to create a pair of barrel armchairs that were composed of walnut slats. She upholstered the chairs in bronze silk velvet. With her partner Evelyn, they submitted six pieces based on the theme of a terrace in southern France. The Chanou workshop did most of the work on the cubist table, whose solitary leg was made of pearl wood that sprouted up to hold a round tabletop. Reporters indicated that the visitors definitely took a second look at Elizabeth's furniture, but lined up to see the chaise lounge down the hall. One reviewer said that their display offered a look of modernist simplicity with a touch of opulence. Every piece of fabric, every wood selection, and every finish was expensively made by hand. Another reporter asked if the hints of opulence may be a bit excessive given the uncertainty in the stock market. Oh no! This is bad. Then in October, the stock market crashed. In desperation, Evelyn and Air moved to Evelyn's original home in Cannes, France. They opened their gallery to only a few new guests. The only commission that resulted from opening day was to provide chairs, tables, and rugs to a small restaurant that was near the beach. In conclusion, she gave us a new design language and then faded into the night.